All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, there's been a whole bunch of good perspectives presented today. I'm gonna try and present a little bit of a different one, and this is the perspective of the US-based Silicon Valley investor. So how do they think about you know, the whole agricultural space, agricultural technology? Um, and that's gonna bias a lot of the things I say. So it's in that lens. So there's, there's all these different ways to go about making change. This is in the perspective of, we wanna make an investment in a company. How do you think about what um, the right company to invest in would be? How do you think about making big impact through companies? How do you do this through capitalism, given that it's the current system? Um, how do you do this in the absence of wide-scale behavioral change? Um, so I think pushing for behavioral change, for example, is like really good, whether it's water conservation, um, teaching a kid about agriculture, uh, just like re reduce, reuse, re recycle, reduce meat consumption, but if you assume that that's not gonna change, or at least not gonna change tomorrow, how do you build a business today given that? And so, you know, just to wrap this thought up, one example of the meat side um, that we invest in is a company called Hampton Creek Foods. And so, the way they're going about it is they're saying, well, you know, eggs are a problem both for animal cruelty and for, you know, all the climate change that they cause. We eat a lot of eggs, what if you could do it plant-based? No behavioral change. People don't even know the difference. It's cheaper, it's healthier, it tastes the same. Um, so that's kind of the, the lens that we put on things. Cool. So I'm curious to get your perspective on, even at a, at a bigger picture level, how does Silicon Valley approach ag tech? Yeah, good question. So I think um, one of the lenses that Silicon Valley usually uses is, what has this company developed that can't be copied? So let's say you, you make something really good it's gonna make a huge difference. Why should we invest in this company? What if, what if next month another one comes across that sees the good thing this one just did and copies it? And so one big question is, what about this is really defensible? And because of that question, we often invest in technology companies or things where there's, you know, they're kind of owning a, a little piece of the whole value chain. And so one thing Brian talked about, which I think was really interesting, is kind of system level farming. And um, I think there's actually ways to do that in a really defensible way, um, which we can talk about. But, but I think at a high level, you kind of break down the pieces into more of the linear farming approach. You know, what can you do on the seed side? What can you do on the nutrient side? Uh, what do you do about infrastructure and land? How do you get that more cheaply or like finance that? What can you do in financing? Can you do things with insurance? Can you do monitoring with drones maybe? Um, all these sorts of things, precision agriculture, robotic farming. Um, really a wide range. I think it's, it's all those different pieces. And I think usually in Silicon Valley, either a company or a founder tries to really take one of those pieces that they think they can own and improve in a big way. Sometimes it's that 10x thinking. Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, 10x return for the farmer. Can I do something that maybe improves yield a couple percent, but for every dollar they put down, they're going to get 10 back this year. Um, so it's usually really focused on one specific thing and saying what's the innovation or the insight that we have that can, that can build a big company there. So we talk about um, creating new technology and also application of existing technology. Yeah, sure. So I think one, one big space where people have been talking a lot about it is drones. I think everyone's heard a ton about drones. And um, I've actually met with at least four or five companies that are using drones for agriculture. And the specific application of that is, I think it's, there's probably ways that it's applicable in New Zealand. It's highly applicable in the US where there's lots of grain and corn production. And so the question there is, you've got this huge corn field. How do you monitor it? How do you know where you're over and underwatering? Let's use a drone to go out and take that imagery. And then using that, plug it back into the farm management system and uh, figure out where can we water less, where, where should we water more to get higher yield. So it's all about that you know, yield per acre sort of question. But I think that's one place. Um, let's see, so drones are one. I think just general robotics is one. Um, whether it's harvesting or planting, um, that's all very conventional. I think there's also just, in the farming industry, wide scale applications of IT that can be done. So farm management software um, and you know, I think farm management software is actually a great place to start thinking about permaculture. So, you know, if, you, if you're the world expert in permaculture, maybe the way to get that 
just really widespread across millions of acres of farmland is create the best farm management software. And maybe there's a drop down, you know, which, what sort of farm management do I want to do? I want to do permaculture. And it just has all the details of what you need to do. And everybody just immediately knows what to do and they're hooked up with all the suppliers. So I think um, just general IT is actually probably a huge opportunity area. Hmm. Are there um, certain ways investment communities can be thinking about measuring impact, so societal and, and uh, ecological impact that are spanning beyond just the immediate financial returns? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, you know, I think it would be on an investment by investment basis. I think that would be the right way to think about it. And um, maybe you take water, for example. So most freshwater use, as we just heard, is for agriculture, 70%. And I think something like 90% is industrial plus ag. So, you know, I think an investor and a company could think about what's our actual impact on the environment by saying, let's say they had a water reducing technology, whether it's on the crop side that lets maybe, you know, cornfields go unwatered and still have similar yield, or just much more efficiently applies irrigation. And so I think they would just say, we have you know this many acres, and we know that it reduces water consumption from this to this. And so we, through our technology, basically just saved X million gallons of, of water and, and had this impact. And I think um, that's the quantitative way that, that they would probably think about it in general. And then I think there's a separate question of what's that worth? And I think, um, you know, somebody somebody else mentioned in, in one of the audience questions, um, basically, you know, this is great if you're making things sustainable. How do you capture that benefit that you're bringing to the world? A lot of it's, you know, secondary costs that are not borne by the company, just by the consumer at the end of the day, or by people aren't, who aren't even consumers. Um, and I think that the way to do that is often through branding. Um, you know, in the absence of policy change. So, if, if you know, so I guess the point is, um, if you're a company that's making a huge difference, like a triple bottom line company, I think it's, it's beholden on you to actually try and bake that into your brand and make sure that that's perceived by the customer so you can make sure that you're actually capturing some of that value so you can then pump it back into doing more good. And when we were talking earlier, you mentioned, uh, quite a few companies, ag tech companies, that have approached you guys. Um, what are some of the things that you're looking for and in innovations in this space? And what would be an investable uh, ag tech project? Yeah, good question. So um, I touched on one of them before, defensibility. If you do this and it works, why does no one else just copy you and then just try and undercut you on price? That is a real question. That's what's going to determine if the company can make money over the long term, this is simply the, this is the investor perspective. Um, if we don't do a good job making money, someone else is going to get that money to invest. So we need to balance both of those things. Luckily, at Founders Fund, what we really believe is that if we solve the world's biggest problems or we invest in the companies who are solving them, that's going to be worth a lot. Um, and so you, these two things of like do good and, and make money are actually aligned. Um, and there's companies that, that make money that aren't doing good. We try to not invest in those. Um, but what was the original question? <laughs> Is that, does that answer it at all? It does. Well, OK, so yeah, yeah, what do we look for? So we look for companies that can really make a meaningful impact on a big industry. So you know, I think most investors say that. But when we say that, we really mean, can this company come to do something better than anybody else in the world and just own that function of ag tech? Where they're not, you know, they're not trying to block others out. They're just continued, continually doing it, doing it better and better and better. And with the money they make, putting it back into the business so they can improve their products. Um, so we, we require that. We want to know they're going to be around for a while. And we want to know that they're doing something good. And so it's got to be something that, if it works, it really moves the needle on, on civilization overall. And have there been any trends that you've been noticing uh, over the last few years in terms of the amount of talent and energy that's going to the ag tech space? Yeah, definitely. So there's probably two sides, there's at least a few sides. One is definitely drones. A lot of people are, are asking themselves, we have drones now, how do we use them? What are they good for? What's the, f what's the first best business case? And I think it's imagery plus covering a lot of land. 
and that means ag in a lot of cases. Um, I think we're seeing stuff on the bio side, um, creative plant breeding. Um, how do you track what, what plants you bred and what output they give? Just basic IT software like that. Um, how do you do things with plant supplements that are not fertilizer? How do you, you know, basically breed plants that are very uh, stress hardened for drought conditions so that you don't have to irrigate? Um, and so it's, it's things like that. But I'd say there's been a big increase both on the bio side, on the IT side. Um, there's a company in the US called Farm Logs. Um, we're not investors in it, but um, from what I hear, they're doing really well. What they do is farm management software for U.S. Uh, grain and corn growers. So this is definitely a big, big uh, focus area for Silicon Valley. I think one of the one of the ways that startups are thinking about things in the valley is what industries just feel really kind of unchanged by information technology and software, and how can we kind of modernize them by applying that. And so that's, I think people are systematically going through these different industries, whether it be um, energy production, agriculture, you know, we saw with the taxi industry, with Uber and Lyft and a few others. And so I think ag is one of those that people are really focused on. And I think it's also because of the sort of stats we saw earlier, which is that if people don't change their meat consumption and a lot of the developing world does choose to eat meat, it's gonna be a problem. And so you know, whether that happens or not, whether or not we can change people's perspective to eat less meat, I think it's in people's minds that this is an issue and therefore we need to focus on ag. And so I think, you know, it's an area that a lot of people have passion about and they wanna, they wanna do things in. And earlier on, Brian brought up the concept of uh, the 10X of uh, improvement or impact in types of activities. Do you see potential of that in the ag tech space as well? Yeah, um, so I guess probably two ways to think about that. One is that, yes, in certain cases, you're going to have the 10x. So I think in some ways, you know, Hampton Creek Foods egg product is 10x. Um, not because it's 10x cheaper. It's not. It's a little bit, you know, it's a bit cheaper. Not because it tastes 10 times better. You can't really tell the difference. But the animal cruelty is way over 10x less. There's none. And the, the healthiness of it is, is probably 10x higher. And so the question is, does that 10x matter to consumers? And I think for that product, it does. Um, and I think going back to the, the cases where you can't get 10x, you know, you're not going to probably get 10x yield per acre by putting down some chemical. That's, those days are probably long gone. Um, the gains would, today would probably be a few percent, maybe 10, 20 percent in the most extreme scenarios. And so the question there is, is this 10x for the person buying it? And so I think it goes back to like, what's the return on investment for a farmer? Can you, can the cost of doing, making the thing be one tenth of the benefit? And I think that's, that's the other way of thinking about it. And our, our sort of methodology is if you've got a 10x product, then you can get behavior change, you can get people switching. If you don't have a 10x product, it's much harder. So I'd like to open it up to the audience to ask questions. But before I do that, this is the second time we're hosting you here. You came and visited us in December. Uh, and just so happy that, that you came back. Yeah. What are some of the opportunities that you see in New Zealand? Uh, we talked a little bit about the concept of incubation nation. But in relation to innovation in the ag tech space. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for the invite back. It's great to be back. Um, Let's see. So I think the, the question, if I, were, if I were New Zealand, the question I would be asking is probably what areas do we have expertise in that the world does not have expertise in? So we can just, we're just way ahead of the curve already and everyone else is going to be playing catch up. And what structural differences do we have that others can't compete on? And I think historically the first, the first category is probably, you know, it sounds like dairy, sheep, maybe a few other spaces. And you know, I think the pastoral farming piece is probably really interesting. So is there a way, given that the industries here are very focused on pastoral farming right now, grazing basically, um, are there insights that have been gained from animal grazing over the last few decades, like systems for doing that very effectively that could be transferred elsewhere? And so could you create you know, grazing software to help you you know, 
end up in a situation where the grass is this high mm. and you have all of your animals grazing around and you're, you're rotating them in a way that they're not eating the grass down to the, down to the very bottom. Mm. So that's probably, you know, the sort of thing that you could imagine. Um, or things in milking, you know, milking robotics, or I know that that's an area that people have done a lot of work in. Um, the other area would be the structural things. So I think New Zealand has a huge advantage <coughs> over other countries, and the U.S. specifically, in less regulation. Um, you know, for example, on drones. I know the FAA just re the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration just released new guidelines for drones, but I still think New Zealand is a much better place to be testing that sort of thing. How can we use drones for agriculture? It's not illegal here, I don't think, not to my knowledge. And if it were illegal in certain ways, the New Zealand government seems much more approachable and open to doing things, revisiting regulation. You know, it's much smaller and, and less bureaucratic than the US. And so I think there's a way to get things done here that there isn't elsewhere. And so you can push harder on new technologies that are beneficial. And as you're talking about drones, one of the concepts that we've been playing around here is uh, with beehives. So creating smart beehives that are uh, tracking the activities of the bees, especially with the fast spread of mites. Um, but all these hives are sp spread around a whole farm. And so how are you able to uh, collect that data and drones could be a, an interesting way uh, of application of that technology. Uh, in in areas where we're practicing sustainable agriculture, yeah. or other sensors in there, yeah, like temperature sensors, uh, noise sensors, whatever it might be. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm curious about the behavior change thing. I totally agree with you. Like, how is it profitable? Assuming that people don't care and don't change, I think that's really important. Um, but also, I'm really curious if there's anything that you guys have invested in that um, it's something that makes. Like, I look at Uber. Uber is a technology that changes our behavior. It changes my behavior. I, I live in London. I don't drive anymore, <laughs> like at all, because I have this little app on my phone, and someone will instantly come pick me up, um, and it's cheaper than a cab. So I'm thinking about um, in what ways could technology, software, innovation, some of these new things that are emerging be applied to help people shift their behavior? And maybe you're seeing things in the quantified self movement, like the Fitbits and things like that, like for people to have a, a better understanding of what they're eating and, and how it affects them, and um, like simple behavior change types of technologies that then shift behavior of millions of people. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have invested in a couple of behavior change companies. Um, Airbnb is one of them. You know, instead of going to hotels, you, you rent out a room. Um, or rent out your house to help pay for the mortgage. We're investors in Lyft, which is, uh, you know, like Uber, going after the same space. I mentioned Hampton Creek. In some ways, that's behavior change because now you're buying, you know, products without eggs. Um, the cookie dough is very good if you if you've had it. Um, but let's see. I think let's see in ag. Well, I guess going back to the health question, um, we're investors in one company that is combining health insurance for individuals in the US with activity trackers. And they're doing things like, you know, if you get X amount of exercise every day and you can prove that through your activity tracker, you're gonna get some dollars off your monthly premium because we know you're gonna be healthier. And so a lot of it is figuring out how do you close the loop on the behavior so that you are actually incentivizing the behavior through the cost structure of your product somehow. So you could see that exact same application for reducing meat consumption if the insurance companies thought that was an important priority. And if you could prove it. If you could, if you could somehow track it in such a way that it, was, it seemed provable. Um, so yeah, there's probably ways to do it with water, with energy use. Um, and then I think one thing actually, to a point Brian brought up um, earlier, I think was the problem in the US, there's these structural problems like water has no price. How do you fix that? And the reason for that is that specific plots of land has specific amounts of water allocated to them through water rights. And so, you know, you would, you would end up saying there's no way to fix this. But I think, I think that there's one approach, which is let's go through regulation, try and change that. The other way that we really like is how do you hack the system so that you don't even have to worry about the regulation side, just find, just find a tiny loophole. And so for the water thing, maybe it's, oh, maybe there's some way, me with my plot of land and my water rights, can I now use drip irrigation rather than trough irrigation 
use only a quarter of my water rights and somehow resell the rest off to somebody else. And I think there's probably concepts like that out there that, that could work. I don't know if that one specifically would work, but um, there's probably ways to do it. So it's all about kind of incentivizing behavior through the cost structure. Other questions? This for us. Yeah, Brian talked earlier about uh, open source as an approach, and I'm just curious to, to what extent does an open source approach or philosophy work for or against Silicon Valley investing criteria? Yeah, good question. So I think there's been a bunch of successful open source companies in the Valley, and my understanding, we haven't invested in too many of those because they're a little bit of, a, it's kind of a different sort of beast in some ways, um, but I think, let's see, I think the structure that most of them, the successful ones have used is, let's start an open source project. We will be the experts on it. No one will be able to beat us on knowing this project better than us. And many enterprise customers are still going to need support in implementing that, making sure it's like actually carried out throughout the organization. And so we will be like, you know, there's the open source software. We'll have maybe an even more advanced stack on top of that software that's bundled with a customer service piece or a consulting piece, and then that's usually what has seemed to work pretty well. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that that's one way. I think the other way would be you have this open source project around permaculture or around better, more sustainable farming practices, and then you somehow bake that into another product. Um, so you become world experts in something. Now if you want to have that just all done for you, you know, buy our farm automation and management product that's, you know, just plain old you know, web-based software and manage your farm through here. And by the way, you're going to get all the open source benefits of, of our permaculture research. Um, I think when people look at the social impacts of what they're doing, they struggle to separate, hey, can I prove that I make an impact from can I monetize this? I'm just curious, it sounds like the t sorts of deals you're talking about where monetization might be unproven or experimental, it sounds like you really have to have that clear before Silicon Valley are, are talking. I don't know, like say you try to substitute something before an emerging economy is eating meat, you want to be in front of that hypothetically. Like how, how directly are you pointing at a, at a monetization model before you're talking to investors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's kind of a, probably not the answer you're looking for, but it kind of depends. So I think it's all about, you know, what level of proof do you need? And I think the level of proof can be, we're actually monetizing, or, you know, we have contracts in place that suggest we'll be able to monetize, or, you know, consumers say that they'll pay extra for this, all the way down to like, conceptually, it just makes sense. And I think different investors are willing to buy in at different stages of that. Um, and so it's just a level of like how convincing is the narrative uh, that this is going to be monetizable. So, um, you know, we were early investors in in Facebook. You know, back early on, they had no revenue whatsoever. But I think the premise was if you can get this to be something that people spend a lot of time on and really value, then you will be able to monetize that. And I think that that belief was strong enough that there didn't have to be direct evidence. There's already kind of um, other evidence in the markets that if you got a lot of eyeballs or a lot of time spent on a site, you could monetize that. And I think um, the same thing probably applies uh, to ag and to other spaces too. Awesome. Thank you all for, for the questions. Sure. Uh, how, do you guys have anybody who kind of keeps you guys in check? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, so, so let's see, our team keeps each other in check. That's one. Okay. How old is everybody? <laughs> so everybody applies a, a different filter to everything. Some people are focused on different aspects of the company. Um, you know, some people are more focused on, is this the team that's going to make this really successful? Some people are focused on, is this something that and all the other investors are already looking at and we shouldn't be investing in it. We're not making enough difference if everyone else is investing. We need to do our own thing to make the biggest difference. Other people are focused on, is this good for the world? So I think we apply all these different filters. So internally, there's that, there's that sort of perspective. I think secondarily, we're investing, you know, some is our own capital, but most of it is from other investors like pension funds and endowments and things like this. And they want to see that we're investing in things that are good too. That's, that's what they've bought into is returns plus positive impact. 
in some way. And so, you know, if we were investing in things that were clearly bad, I think we would hear about it. And I think the third way is we believe that if companies are clearly doing bad things, it will impact them in a negative way because the consumer, there's just too much transparency in the world at this point. People know it, it gets out. If you're doing something evil, it's going to come back to haunt you. And so we don't want to invest in companies that have that kind of liability hanging over their heads. Just, you guys have a lot of power. So I love the, the mentorship. Uh, the, the internal checking is very sound, very sound. What I wish is that there's like a mentor figure that's in the outside of the company that has been around for a long time, a melder, that says, is this the whole thing? Is this viable? Because you guys have a lot of influence. Yeah, no, that's great. We should probably be looking for even more of those people. Yeah. Good idea. Scott, thanks very much yeah, for, thank you. for your talk and uh, yeah, thank you.